Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for July 12th, 2018. On today's episode, we'll talk about the 2018 Emmy nominations, the snubs and surprises. Joining me at today's podcast is Slash Film Managing Editor, Jacob Paul. Hello, hello. Weekend Editor, Bradford Oman. Hey, that's me. Senior Writer, Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? And Writer, Y Tran Bowie. Hey, everyone. We almost have a full house today to talk about the Emmy nominations, which were announced this morning. Brad, you were up early to write this up for the site. Uh, tell us about the big awards. I mean, I don't know if I was up early because the Emmys aren't nominated anywhere near as early as the Oscars when you have to be up at the crack of dawn to get those. But this morning was chock full of plenty of Emmy nominations news. Um all the big categories were announced live uh, by the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. So we're going to dive in and we're just going to talk about uh, some of the uh, major categories and have a little bit of chatter about those. So obviously the, um, we're going to start off with the, the acting category since that's you know usually where we start off with when it comes to the awards. So looking at um, Outstanding Lead Actor in a Comedy Series, the nominations are Anthony Anderson for Blackish. Ted Danson for The Good Place, Larry David for Curb Your Enthusiasm, Donald Glover for Atlanta, Bill Hader for Barry, and William H. Macy for Shameless. Pretty good lineup there. Uh, what do you guys think about the nominations for lead actor in a comedy series? Let's go to Ben. I, I almost think that um, Bill Hader and Donald Glover, like, there's almost as much drama, maybe if not more drama in those performances than comedic moments. So, uh, like, the uh, the delineation between drama and comedy uh, in the Emmys has always fascinated me. I, it's interesting to see where they draw the line each year as far as, like, which shows are considered which. Um, but I guess once those categories are locked in then it's just like a matter of who's the lead in you know in this particular show but uh glover and hater are both really great on both of their shows um ted danson in the good places is just a, a joy so i'm very glad on a personal level to see him in there as well yeah ted danson uh was i was so glad to see that he finally got recognized because it was such a bummer that uh, he didn't get recognized when after the first season of The Good Place was out, and it's it, I'm just so glad because he is phenomenal on that show. But yeah, I I feel like he's not going to be able to take down Donald Glover or Bill Hader, who are all right. So uh, let's jump into uh, keeping with the comedy category. We'll go to lead actress in a comedy series. We've got Pamela Adlon for Better Things, Rachel Brosnahan for The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Allison Janney for Mom, Issa Rae for Insecure. Tracy Ellis Ross for Blackish and Lily Tomlin for Grace and Frankie. So, what do you guys think about the nominations in the, this category? So, I've only seen the out of this these uh mo- these shows. I've only seen the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. So, I, I'm definitely gunning for Rachel Brosnahan, who is really great in that role. But the really interesting thing to me is that all of these lead actress comedy roles are more sort of traditional. Uh, sitcoms versus the darker media roles that we've seen in like Atlanta or Barry for the male roles, which is, I think, really unfortunate because there aren't as many meaty, juicy roles for women in these darker comedies. Uh, They just have uh, more of the sitcoms or occasionally an Amazon series like The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which is sad. No, that's that's a good point. Um, I I do think the better things kind of skews against the traditional sitcom style because um, Pamela Adlon, it, it's basically like uh, Pamela Adlon's own version of Louis, Louis C.K. series, because he was the executive producing that series before his fall from grace due to his inappropriate behavior. Um, but yeah, otherwise, you know, Allison Janney and uh, Tracy Ellis Ross, they're on you know pretty much traditional network sitcoms. Um, Easter Rays show Insecure is. A little bit more of one of those edgy shows, but I wouldn't call it dark. You know, if if anything, it's just it's kind of uh, hip with a little bit of edge. And Grace and Frankie kind of steers towards more of like the older crowd. You know, people who are still you know interested in Lila Tomlin and Jane Fonda. So uh, you know, it's 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 definitely not as I guess exciting of a category. And I I do wish that that there were some more meaty roles that would allow them to allow actresses to get a little bit darker in the way that Bill Hader and Donald Glover do for sure. By the way, I want to take this opportunity to say that it is weird that Grace and Frankie is produced by Skydance, the company that brings you, you know, the Mission Impossible movies and Terminator Genesis. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'm derailing this whole thing. Brad, you, you, can, you can move on. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's flip on to the other side and talk about the acting categories for drama series. 
Uh, for lead actor in a drama series, we've got Jason Bateman for Ozark, Sterling K. Brown for This Is Us, Ed Harris for Westworld, Matthew Reese for The Americans, Milo Ventimiglia for This Is Us, and Jeffrey Wright for Westworld. What do you guys think about these nominations? This is a hell of a category. Uh, I'll admit that This Is Us is my laundry show. It's the show I put on half watch while I do laundry. But whenever Sterling K. Brown is on, like I put the laundry down. Wait, he wait, wait, so Jacob. Good. How do you do laundry while you're crying? <laughs> I, I don't cry. I roll my eyes slightly when I realize that This Is Us is the best show at manipulating people. Uh, he uses the laundry to wipe his tears, Peter, <laughs> obviously. But, uh, my love movie is very good in this show, but Sterling K. Brown is magnificent. And if the entire show was about him, it wouldn't be a laundry show. It would be a show I do appointment viewing for. But otherwise, uh, you know, as Westworld was uh, in a really weird place this season, but you can't argue that Ed Harris and Jeffrey Wright weren't good on it. Matthew Reese has been great on the Americans for the entire run. Jason Bateman, I, I haven't seen Ozark yet, but uh, Jason Bateman is oh, a good actor. So, Jacob, uh, you need yeah. to see Ozark. J- Jason okay. Bateman in Ozark is is great. He's uh, Not that he hasn't been great in other things, but I feel like he's finally found a great role because it lets him do the comedy, but it also lets him do the dark uh, kind of side of him. Um, I mean, it's definitely like you know the Breaking Bad of uh, Netflix TV. All right, I'll have to add this to my million other Netflix shows that are, that are clogging up my list. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, uh, Matthew Reese is, like, especially for this last season of The Americans, I, I would love to see him get some some recognition. Uh, you know, everyone's been ranting and raving about Sterling K. Brown, obviously. Uh, but, yeah, Matthew Reese has always put in an amazing performance in The Americans. And for, there was a little while where the show wasn't even getting recognized by the Academy, which was quite the travesty because it's, it's definitely one of the best – uh, dramas that's been on TV for uh, in a while to not get that much recognition. So I, I would like to see uh, him take it home. But the actors, uh, let's move on to the actresses in the drama category. We've got Claire Foy for The Crown, Tatiana Maslany for Orphan Black, Elizabeth Moss for The Handmaid's Tale, Sandra O oh for Killing Eve, Carrie Russell for The Americans, and Evan Rachel Wood for Westworld. How are we feeling about these nominations? Uh, I'll jump in and say that I am shocked to see Evan Rachel Wood on here because I think she, I mean, she's like, okay, so. I mean, she's just playing brooding this entire season, right? Right. Yeah. The, this, that's the thing is like a lot of times for these big HBO prestige shows, the same actress will get nominated over and over again. But like, I feel like they're, they're getting nominated for being associated with the show that a lot of people watch, but not necessarily being nominated for delivering, you know, a stellar performance in that particular season. Like, you know, she was much better in season one, I think, because she had that ability to actually play a bunch of different ranges as Dolores. But in season two of Westworld, she's really in like that boring Terminator mode for the entire season. Like there's nothing to her character in season two. So I, this this one was baffling to me. Yeah, I compare the Claire Foy in The Crown who is doing such amazing, subtle, nuanced work throughout that entire show, where you're watching her play a woman that the entire world has known, uh, Queen Elizabeth, and is doing it in, in ways that make us understand her as a human being. Like, it's not even on the same level. Like, Claire Foy uh, is my favorite nominee here by far, even though I like um, Elizabeth Moss and Carrie Russell. Uh, it's just, I don't understand why Ed Rachel Wood, who's a really good actress, is, is on here when her show gave her nothing to do when The Crown is so rich and full of full of things for it to lead to do. For sure. Um, so that's it for the major acting categories. I want to do a, a quick steer into animation for a moment, simply because uh, in the outstanding animated program category, we've got a pretty good lineup of nominees this year, including the first nomination for a show that is uh, a favorite amongst our our readers. So uh, for outstanding animated program, we have Baymax Returns Big Hero 6, the series, Bob's Burgers, Rick and Morty, The Simpsons, and South Park. I don't watch that many of these animated shows, but it's it's just astounding to me that The Simpsons and South Park have been on as long as they have been and are still being uh, <laughs> being rewarded. I wonder if it's like one of those things like I was just talking about in terms of like the name recognition uh, alone, if that's what's actually doing it. Like, Brad, do you think this most recent season of South Park uh, deserves to to put this that show in this company? No, and, and honestly, like... Uh... South Park, the, the past couple seasons haven't been that great, and I would have much rather seen a show like Big Mouth get that nomination instead. Uh, you know, it's it's newer, it's it, it's it's edgier, it seems to, you know, be more confident in itself despite being a freshman series. 
whereas South Park has kind of struggled to figure out which direction where they want to go and how to handle certain topical events that have happened, you know, uh, ever since the administration has changed hands. Um, but it is good to see Rick and Morty in there. Uh, I, you know, they've deserved it for a while, and it's good to finally get get them a nomination. But I'm I'm also surprised to see that uh, the Big Hero Six series has been nominated against all of those shows that are basically geared more towards adult. Um, so I guess that show must be really good if it's standing up. Uh, you know, going toe to toe with these other animated shows. I, I'm actually shocked because I didn't even know that show was on the air yet. <laughs> yeah, I've never heard of it. <laughs> Yeah, so I think it started airing back in April or May or something like that on, on Disney XD. Yeah, I know we ran some trailers and stuff. For, for some reason, I just thought it was, you know, coming this fall or something. Does, nope. anybody, does anybody watch Bob's Burgers? I've heard really I, good things about that show. Oh, it's so I've good. Seen, it's really good. I've seen a couple of seasons, and it's really funny. It's really smart and warm-hearted as well surprisingly uh so i i'm happy that it's got a nomination i feel like it, it it deserves a nomination more than the simpsons does so it's good that's included there all right um so switching back over to the live action uh category we're going to get back into comedy uh the big award for outstanding comedy series uh and this year we've got a pretty impressive lineup that includes atlanta barry blackish curb your enthusiasm glow the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Silicon Valley, and the Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. How do you choose a show from that lineup? What do you guys think about these nominations? You choose Barry. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm the guy that comes on this podcast and I say I'm not a comedy guy, but I can't even choose between this lineup. I, I love at least three of these shows. It, it's an incredible lineup of comedy. We are in peak TV. Yeah, they're all great in their own ways, too. Like It's, it's actually quite the eclectic uh comedy lineup they're all they're all funny in different ways uh they all do drama in their own special way to you know to add to the comedy uh it's yeah it's just it's it's an incredible lineup for sure i don't want to sound i don't want to sound flippant when i said you, you choose barry because i love other shows on this list but i just have a hard time calling glow a comedy glow is very funny but i think it's being shoved in this into this category when it walks a genre tightrope so i just have a really hard time Measuring it up against other sh- other other shows that are like more geared toward laughs, so I guess maybe I'm being unfair because Glow is an amazing television show. Uh, I, don't think, I think people would categorize Barry in the same way too because it's quite dark as well. Yeah, I think and, you're right there. Yeah, <laughs> though it does have laughs, it's actually I feel like more of a drama in some part. It's kind of what Ben was saying earlier about like a lot of these comedy comedies define categorization just because. They only are really in this category because of the half hour runtime there they have. Yeah, but then you have Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which deals with some pretty dramatic things, and that's you know an hour long show, but it also it also kind of toes the line because it does you know it has some funny moments, but also has a lot of drama and that kind of thing. So I don't know. I think it's I, as far as I know, I, I believe it's up to um, the the distributor or network or whatever submitting the show as to which category they want to be considered in. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I, I don't know, maybe there's some kind of like formula where like you run a timer and be like, okay, how often do you laugh during the show? It, it's, it's a <laughs> I don't even did, think uh, it's that because if you were going by the laughs, like I think Silicon Valley would have to take this out of all those shows. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely has the most laughs per minute. Um, I, Brad, I don't, know, I don't know about that. Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt moves at a breakneck speed and like the punchlines come so fast that sometimes you miss them because you're laughing at something else. All right. So let's flip over to the dramatic side. Uh, this is one of the other major award of the night um, when the awards air in September of this year. For outstanding drama series, we have The Americans, The Crown, Game of Thrones, The Handmaid's Tale, Stranger Things, This Is Us, and Westworld. Another lineup of heavy hitters where it's so hard to choose which show is better than the other one. How are you, how are you guys feeling about this lineup? I can't believe I'm going to say this because I am the biggest fan of Game of Thrones on staff, and I was the biggest fan of Westworld Season 1, I think. But the best show in this lineup is The Crown. That show like crept up and blew me away. I know Chris has watched it, but he's not on the podcast today. Have any of you guys watched The Crown other than me? I still no. have not seen it. No. Yeah, I haven't got a chance to either. I mean, like, I, Handmaid's Tale was, was weak this year. Westworld's weak this year. This is us. The, it's a soap opera that I happen to like. Stranger Things is weak this year. Game of Thrones was impressive, but not as best as it's been. Um, I think and the Americans en- ended well, but I think The Crown is my favorite show here. Yeah, I think it'll be between The Americans and The Crown this year because, like, 
as the uh, as the season's recapper of The Handmaid's Tale, it was a really uneven season. I don't really think that it deserves a win, uh, despite its strength of of uh, themes. But um, the the Americans and the Crown. I haven't seen the Crown yet, but I think those two will probably be the the ones going neck and neck this year. I know we're getting ready to talk about surprises and snubs, and I'm like frankly surprised to see Stranger Things in there. But I guess it's that same thing I was talking about earlier. Like it, it you know, it has so much um, heat on it in, ter- in terms of viewership and part of the cultural zeitgeist and all that stuff. But like season two was not nearly as good as the first season. Like season season one of Stranger Things, I think, is almost a perfect season of television, and season two is far from it. So I, I'm surprised to see it here. But I guess I guess they're you know it's one of those things like the oscars are always trying to uh you know vie for relevance and like making sure they're nominating things that like people actually tune in to make it uh you know to to actually watch the ceremony and i know a ton of people watch stranger things so and this um, way they can have the stranger things kids on bikes again right yeah exactly i mean it's like a red carpet uh golden opportunity that they can't pass up yeah i don't think season two is quite as steep of a drop in quality as people have thought and, and said um, I mean, if you put up the second season of Stranger Things against other possible deserving drama shows, I mean, what else do you think like should take its place instead? <sighs> Brad, why do you got to spring shit on me like this? <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> I gotta, let me let me pause and look something up because I, no, I, 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 I have one for you, for you. <laughs> Ben, and that would Good be luck. Twin Peaks. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah, that's it, that's one. Well, wouldn't when, but wouldn't that technically isn't that doesn't qualify as a limited series? Probably, I guess no, it qualifies as a movie, guys. <laughs> According to David Lynch, yeah, it was eighteen episodes, and I think I mean it, it, there's been a lot of talk about whether or not it's a one and done thing or whether it's going to come back for a potential another season. Um, so yeah, it's still sort of up in the air. But I guess the way they're categorizing it officially is probably like in more in a limited kind of capacity. Yeah, because Big Little Lies was classified in that category, but that's coming back for another round. So yeah, yeah, cool. So yeah, so those are the those are the major categories. Obviously, there are plenty more categories to check out in our list of the Emmy nominees, and there are a bunch that we don't even list because the Emmys have tons of awards for production design and writing and directing and scoring and all that stuff. And so we've got a link to the full uh, PDF list from the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences to check out, along with all of the categories that we usually pay the most attention to uh, over on SlashFilm.com, so make sure you check that out. But uh, one of the things that we do want to dive into before we go today is some of the snubs and surprises, because only so many shows can be nominated, and some people always walk away being upset that certain shows, actors and actresses, didn't get the nomination that they thought they deserved. And so we mentioned some of them, uh, but now we're going to dive in a little bit deeper into which shows uh, either didn't get a nomination that they probably should have, or surprised us by actually landing a nomination instead. We, we all talked about how excited we were that Ted Danson got nominated for The Good Place, uh, but unfortunately that was the only major award that The Good Place received as a nomination. It didn't get a Best Comedy Series nomination, which it totally deserves, um, and I, I feel like that's just a huge mistake. Uh, Michael Schur has proven time and time again that he creates fantastic television. Uh, you know, He's been behind Parks and Recreation, uh, he's on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and he just knows how to make great tv and especially being on network television that can't always be easy because you have to you know appeal to a much bigger audience and the good place has such a unique premise the ensemble cast is is incredible it's funny it's smart uh it's, it's sharp and i just i wish that the academy would recognize the show as a whole you know instead of just throwing some crumbs its way in the, the acting nominations yeah, I totally agree with that. That's my that's my favorite show, my favorite Discovery show, because I, I missed the first season. I just I saw early trailers for it and thought it looks kind of stupid. And I, I fear that a lot of people did the same thing because I know the viewership isn't great, like the numbers and, and ratings and all that for The Good Place aren't, you know, through the roof. But I would highly encourage anybody who maybe saw early trailers or uh, has heard some things about the premise, but uh, but is not actually tuned in to check it out for yourselves because I think uh, anybody listening to this, I'm pretty sure you're going to love this show. For sure. Well, yeah, I think Twin Peaks. Um, you know, we talked about the whether or not it was in the limited category or or you know available to be considered for best drama, and that's still I guess up for contention. But uh, I think one thing that uh, that everybody who watched Twin Peaks: The Return can agree on is Kyle MacLachlan gave an amazing performance. Uh, he played multiple roles in. 
the show. He played FBI agent Dale Cooper in the original Twin Peaks like 25 plus years ago. Uh, and he came back and he portrayed that character very briefly in Twin Peaks The Return. But he spent most of the season as an evil doppelganger whose eyes are just like jet black all the way through. And it's this terrifying haunting performance uh, as this just like embodiment of pure evil, which is so different from what he did as uh, the chipper and lighthearted Dale Cooper earlier on in the, in the earlier version of twin peaks. Uh, And then he also played a a whole different character named Dougie Jones, who was a sort of, a borderline mentally damaged insurance salesman who really i mean it it completely defies description if you if you haven't seen the show uh, if i tried to explain it to you you would be like what the hell are you even talking about and that's basically what twin peaks the return is um but i despised that particular character but i think that mclaughlin i mean the physicality changed for each of those characters that he played um they're so wildly different from each other and he is so good in all of them that i think uh, um, you know, just from a sheer like tour de force acting performance level, I'm, I'm surprised he didn't get nominated for his performance there. So the one that I think was severely snubbed is a show that a lot of people probably haven't seen because they've been turned away by the title, and that's Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. But I wouldn't, uh, I would encourage you not to read the book, judge the book by its cover, because Crazy Ex-Girlfriend is one of the smartest, funniest, and toughest comedies to watch out I watch right now and especially in season three they delve really well and really deftly with issues of mental illness and suicidal thoughts and tendencies and they do it in a with a song in their heart essentially because it is a musical and the way that they balance those that tone of the light-hearted musical with the darker subjects that they tackle is amazing uh, and really graceful and i think that crazy ex-girlfriend and especially uh Rebecca Rachel Bloom's um, character, uh, Rebecca Bunch, she does an amazing job portraying that really unhinged but really sympathetic at the same time lead role. And uh, I think it's, it's it was snubbed for both best comedy as well as best performance by uh, Rachel Bloom. And it's unfortunate because it made such a big splash when it first debuted and won and was nominated for some Emmys for its title sequences, but ever since then has been uh, completely glossed over for all other more um, buzzy comedies. Jacob, uh, a streak was broken this year with this uh, snub at the Emmys. Yeah, uh, Modern Family was not nominated for Outstanding Comedy Series or for anything else in the main categories. And for those of you who actually have seen Modern Family recently, this is not surprising. The show has been good. In, uh, to be fair, has been great in a long time. It's been, maybe it's watchable, passable now, but it's far, far past its prime. But this is the first year since 2010 where Modern Family was not nominated for Outstanding Comedy Series. And that's an almost a decade-long run, and that's that's really impressive for the show. And this shows that the Emmys have finally caught up with the rest of the world, realizing that Modern Family is not one of the five or six best comedy shows on TV right now. Yeah, I definitely uh, agree with you there about Modern Family, because as somebody who loved the show uh, when it was in its prime, it's definitely gone downhill. It's just gotten a little too wacky. Um, uh, changing tone a little bit here uh let's talk about a snub for stranger things uh some of the um acting categories worked out for stranger things um david harbour ended up getting a nomination but one person i thought deserved a nomination this year uh and should have gotten one was noah schnapp um he plays will who was notoriously absent from the first season because he was stuck in the upside down um but in stranger things 2 he is very prominent uh he's a key part of the series because of his link to the upside down and I think that he puts in a fantastic performance as far as his confusion and terror and being possessed, you know, by you know, the, the, the force that is the Upside Down. And so I, I wish that he would have gotten a nomination because I, I think he's great in the series. I think he gives a performance that is uh, akin to the kind of performances that Steven Spielberg would pull from kids, you know, in movies like uh, E.T. and Close Encounters of the Third Kind and stuff like that. He's so tortured in season two. He really is. And he and it's. It isn't. You would think it would be a one-note performance, but it's not. I think he does such a good job with it. Jacob, you've got a, a show that you think deserves a little bit more attention from the Emmys. Yeah, that's uh, Mindhunter, Netflix's uh, serial killer drama uh, that was uh, produced by David Fincher, and has everything you'd think would be in a big Emmy contender in this glossy, slick, procedural, uh, grisly in all the right ways, uh, stellar performances. But it only got one nomination for uh, uh, guest star, and. I don't want to say it's because it's too grisly, because uh, they nominate grisly shows all the time, 
the stigma against Netflix seems to have fallen away, so I don't think it's that. I just think that this show fell through the cracks because Netflix has too many shows, and uh, nobody nobody knows what to watch and when to watch it. I mean, where's Ozark and a lot of these nominations when it gets Best Actor nomination, you know? So I just think that uh, Netflix has a surplus of shows that are really good, and, um, and this one just didn't grab people's eyes or time. Yeah, I wonder how hard Netflix pushes for sh- certain shows and how they choose which ones they really want to make a push for. Um, especially when, you know... It's, it's even frustrating in their app. Like, I'll go to Netflix on the day that, like, say, a show like Glow comes out, and I loved Glow Season 1, I gave it a thumbs up, and it will not be anywhere in the app. I have to, like, go searching for it. And it's just, like, weird, their algorithm or... Uh, you know, I know you guys are talking about, you know, campaigns on television, billboards and all that kind of stuff as well. But like even even their interface is like hard to find stuff sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Uh, another Netflix show that got lost in the cracks is one that uh, HT is going to talk about. American Vandal. So this is a series that I think was one of the best comedies of last year. And it completely it went away without any nods except for one for um, uh, writing for one episode. And uh, it was uh, admittedly up against some tough competition because it was up for the limited series category, which is mostly drama heavy uh, with shows like um, The Alienist and um, other series, as well as Jesus Christ Superstar for some reason. Uh, But but, um, American Vandal is such a funny sort of send up of the true crime zeitgeist that we're currently in now. And it's a mockumentary series that really balances that silly sort of SNL premise of who drew the dicks and the authentic, like emotional angst of teenage high school society. And it really balances that well. And it's unfortunate that it was completely forgotten come Emmy season, except for one sort of cursory writing nod. Jacob, bring us back to cable with a show that deserves some more attention. Okay, I'm going scri- to describe a show to you real quick. Uh, it's on AMC, a prestigious network. Uh, big budget, recognizable actors doing stellar work, period drama with costumes, big visual effects, sweeping epic based on a thousand-page novel, and it's The Terror, and it didn't get nominated because it's a horror show. The only horror show the Emmys like is American Horror Story for some reason. Uh, and The Terror has everything you think Emmy voters would love, except the fact that it's about a giant monster killing people in the middle of the Arctic. Or uh, the Arctic or, or North Pole, whatever whatever ice wasteland that's in here. And uh, Chris, who isn't here, would agree with me because he, he recapped the entire show. It's a genre masterpiece. It's spellbinding. It's amazing. It's uh, Jared Harris doing career best work in the lead. Uh, but it's also about a giant monster murdering people, and that's the basic thrust of the show. So uh, even though it has everything you think voters want, it's not here. Speaking of ice wastelands, uh, a couple actors who are pretty familiar with that kind of territory didn't get any nominations this year. Why don't you tell us about that, Jacob? Oh, yes, uh, Amelia Clark and Kit Harrington for Game of Thrones both submitted themselves in the lead category this year, which is a big mistake on Game of Thrones because that show has no leads. It has 30 to 50 supporting characters who are all swapping out the spotlight Every every so often to to share it with each other, and you can see like uh, Game of Thrones got like get four or five acting nominations, in supporting and guest categories, but uh, Jon Snow and Daenerys uh, Stormborn of House Targaryen were left out in lead categories. I think it's because Game of Thrones is not a show built to showcase leads; it's a show to built to showcase an ensemble. So these actors they just don't have that star power; they don't have that the, the screen time or the wattage to stand out in the leading category. So even though they're good actors doing good performances and a good season. It was a mistake to put themselves in this category. All right, so uh, we've done a lot of complaining as far as the shows that didn't get the recognition that we thought they deserve. Uh, but there were some pleasant surprises. Um, in, in some cases, a couple of things were uh, perplexing surprises. Uh, and one of the, the biggest ones, I think, in my opinion, is the fact that there was a nomination for Roseanne. Uh, thankfully, it wasn't for the show itself or for Roseanne Barr, who is now damned to you know <laughs> obscurity because of her racist behavior and loud mouth. But uh, one deserving nomination that shouldn't be controversial at all is the fact that Laurie Metcalf got a nomination for the show uh, for supporting actress in comedy series, um, and that's definitely deserved. She is fantastic. I, I wish that they could have retooled the show to focus on her. Uh, her character is great. Um, she she's riding a wave of buzz from Lady Bird, and she's she was always one of the best parts of Roseanne, and she was one of the best parts of the new series for sure. And so it's a deserved nomination. 
it's a, sh- a shame that we won't get to see uh, um, how she would have played out at, uh, because of Roseanne's terrible behavior. Uh, but I'm glad that she was able to get some recognition as the the show starts to go down in flames. Uh, Peter, you uh, wrote a little bit about uh, Sandra O oh getting a nomination for Killing Eve, which is kind of a big deal for a number of reasons. Yeah, uh, you know, sometimes in Hollywood, it only takes 30 years to be considered an overnight success. And uh, it's no surprise, honestly, that Sandra O. Oh uh, is fantastic. Uh, she's been killing it for over a decade on Grey's Anatomy, a show I don't watch, but you know, whenever I've seen it on the air, she's been fantastic. And uh, you know, she was nominated for Best Supporting Actress for that role. Uh, you know, she's made a bunch of appearances on the big screen, but like now, everybody's talking about Killing Eve. Uh, I've seen a, cu- a few of the episodes of this. I have not finished the first season of Killing Eve, uh, but she in this show has been given the spotlight to shine and uh you know the show without her would have been totally different i think um her comic timing is impeccable the show is subversive and fresh and uh it's her execution of this multifaceted complicated complicated character uh that has everybody talking uh her nomination for best actress is a pleasant surprise because it is the first time uh best actress in a drama series has been nominated as a Asian actress. Uh, and uh, this comes after last year, Riz Ahmed uh, was the first man of Asian descent to win leading actor actor in a drama. So uh, I think we're headed in a good direction. And, you know, it's worth noting that Killing Eve is a great series. And, uh, you know, sometimes we, you know, there's like those words that get thrown out like uh you know strong female character and you know the the thing you know things that like uh hg likes to groan about uh but uh you know this show isn't about her being asian and it, she does a great job like you know it's just a, a great performance all around and uh i i'm very glad to see her you know getting a nomination for this role all right so uh one of the surprises we've already kind of touched upon this so we won't spend too much time but uh, it was a huge surprise for Ted Danson to get nominated for The Good Place. After The Good Place was snubbed for the first season, uh, it was thought that maybe the second season wouldn't get uh, any recognition. But it was very nice to see Ted Danson recognized for his incredible performance. Um, he's just so mischievous and hilarious on that show. Uh, and also a cool uh, nomination that The Good Place got was Maya Rudolph received one for uh, Guest Actress on a comedy series. Uh, and she had a good role. Uh, towards the end of the second season, that was pretty great as well. Um, ben, along the lines of surprises that are kind of puzzling, you've got something to talk about here. Yeah, I think earlier Jacob said something about that nobody could deny that uh, Ed Harris and Jeffrey Wright were great in the season of Westworld. And Jacob, I'm here to deny it, sir. I steadfastly deny this. I think they were both pretty questionable in the season. Um, really? Not... You... Because I think the writing was just so bad. I, I think they didn't really have that much to do. Like, so I, I always enjoy Jeffrey Wright. I think he's great. And Ed Harris is like a legend in his field. But like uh, Jeffrey Wright maybe had one or two moments in season two that stood out to me as being, you know, anything more than just uh, – like a, a basic sort of baseline performance for uh, for what he normally does. There wasn't n- anything special there. And I think Ed Harris like actually got worse than than he did and than he was in season one because season two is just like him doing these countless droning monologues that just go on forever. It's like anytime he sat down at a table, I was like, oh God, here it comes. Cause you know he's gonna go off on like this 10 minute uh conversation with somebody and it's just like he had this overly gravelly voice and it just felt like an affectation. And it, it, I don't know. I I just, I feel like these performances were not especially award worthy because they weren't even satisfying to me on any sort of dramatic level within the narrative that, that Westworld was trying to tell. I thought they did. I thought they (laughs) quid themselves well with material they were given. Uh, I can't say like the, I can't say the show was good this year, but I thought they were, I thought they were excellent. Uh, But you know, to each his own on this one. You, you know, there is an actress on that show that didn't get nominated that should have got nominated, but to fully appreciate that performance, you would have to get to, like, the final episode and, you know, kind of revisit some of the performance along the way, and I, I, that is a spoiler, so I can't really get into that. HT, you've got a surprise that was pretty good for a show that you cover pretty extensively for Slash Film. What do you got? 
Yeah, another show that has quite an uneven second season, but has had stellar performances all around is The Handmaid's Tale. And one surprise uh, nomination that we got from that is Yvon Strahovski, who plays Serena Joy in the series. And the show is just jam-packed with great performances all around, Elizabeth Moss, Anne Dowd, Alexis Bledel. But they kind of overshadowed a the performance by Ivan Shapovsky, who gives, I think, the most complex and layered performance that we've seen in this series, just because she has so much that she has to balance and do as a, basically the the villain of this series, um, who often resorts to outright cruelty. And um, but she there are, she really pulls off the moments of sympathy and vulnerability that we see especially in season two and it's amazing how well she's able to um, draw out our sympathy for her our empathy for her while still presenting a really horrible person so uh, Yvonne Strahovski did a great job and she had some great showcases this season and um, I think definitely she is well deserving of her spot amongst her fellow actresses right on uh, and to wrap things up I um... I want to talk about a few surprises of varying degrees that came in the form of nominations for Saturday Night Live. Uh, the show got a nomination for Outstanding Variety Sketch Series, and it, it always consistently gets some nominations uh, for a couple cast members and also for the guest hosts. Uh, Kate McKinnon got a nomination this year as a cast member. Tina Fey got a nomination for uh, guest hosting, and I believe Donald Glover did as well. But th- there were three nominations this year that were all... Varying degrees of surprising. Uh, the first one is Alec Baldwin, which I was surprised by simply because I think he's gotten worse as Donald Trump as time has gone on. And most of the political sketches, especially when it comes to the cold opens involving Alec Baldwin as Donald Trump, have been mostly bad. Very rarely have they been good. So much that they have relied on even more stunt casting for other characters from the administration and the, and headlines involving Trump's administration. I um, completely agree with you, by the way. Yeah, he's just it's it's just been it's turned into it, he was I honestly thought he was really good his first time out, but now it feels like he's on autopilot. They don't really give him anything to do, and some of it I think comes from the fact that like it's hard to make fun of something that's already so blatantly ridiculous and mm-hmm. just upsetting anyway. But I just, I just don't think he's been that good uh, over the past season as, as Donald Trump um, on the opposite end of the spectrum. Keenan Thompson got a nomination as a cast member, which is I think fantastic because he hasn't gotten a nomination like this before. He previously received a writing nomination for a specific uh, sketch for writing music lyrics uh, for a Saturday night live digital short or rather just a regular short, since they don't really do digital shorts anymore, technically. Um, but Keenan Thompson, to me, is consistently one of the MVPs of Saturday Night Live. And he often makes bad sketches better than they have a right to be, and he makes great sketches even better. Uh, he's just He doesn't seem like he has much versatility, but he brings so much energy and char- charisma to, to like certain characters. And he even makes certain characters funny when you're maybe not entirely in on the joke. There's been a couple times where he's played certain sports figures where I don't really understand like what the gag is, but he's made them funny just because of how he plays the character. And so I thought it was really cool for him to get a nomination, especially since he got started his career way back when, when he was on all of that in the nineties. I just think that's awesome. And then Leslie Jones also got a nomination, which going back to a surprise that I didn't really think was warranted she didn't really do much this past season that stood out to me that was worthy of an Emmy nomination. Um, every now and then she ha- does some funny things as a, a supporting character, and she does good bits on Weekend Update that are tantamount to you know little stand-up s- segments like Pete Davidson does. But I, I don't know, it just it was weird to me that she got nominated for this year when she doesn't have a breakout character other than when she does commentary as herself on Weekend Update. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally agree. And Keenan, man, like he's so good this year. I think he's going to I think there's a legitimate case to be made for Keenan Thompson as like one of the top five SNL performers of all time. I, I agree with you I'd guys put, on Keenan. I yeah. think that he should have been nominated way before this. I don't know if I'd put him top five, but he's definitely one of the best. And uh, now he's the longest running cast member, too, which is pretty cool. OK, I think this wraps it up for today's edition of Slash Film Daily. Uh, guys. Uh, let's go, let's briefly go through where people can find you. Jacob, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, I'm on slashfilm.com every single day and I'm on Twitter where I'm at Jacob S. Hall. Brad, where can I find you? 
at Ethan underscore Anderton on Twitter, and I've got a podcast called Go Flix Yourself, available on iTunes and some other places you can find podcasts. Ben, where are you hiding? Uh, I'm hiding on Twitter at Ben Pears, and I'm uh, out in the open at SlashFilm.com, where you can read some of my Die Hard 30th anniversary coverage. I want to throw a quick plug for that, so just uh, search Die Hard 30th anniversary on the site. You'll find it. HD. Every day at SlashFilm.com, and I'm on Twitter at HTranBooey. You can find me at SlashFilm.com and at SlashFilm on all social media. Uh, SlashFilm Daily is published every weekday uh, on iTunes, Google Play, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Please feel free to send us your feedback, questions, comments, concerns to Peter at SlashFilm.com. Go rate and review this podcast on iTunes. Tell your friends. Spread the word. We will talk to you tomorrow.